Hello, my name is James Vanatakis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Australian American Fulbright Commission here in Canberra. This week's conversation is with Professor Howard Schweber, who's a Professor in Constitutional Law at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and in 2011 was a Fulbright Flinders University Distinguished Chair in American Political Science. Now, this conversation is based around the concept of what is the new public sphere and how do we understand it compared to the old public sphere. And it's on the back of former President Trump's decision to sue uh, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube for deplatforming earlier this year. Now, while some celebrated that decision, others from across the political spectrum raised concerns. So to figure out what all this means, we're joined by Howard Schweber. Howard, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So my name is Howard Schwaber, as you mentioned. I'm a professor of political science and a faculty member at the law school and in legal studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, my research areas kind of move around over time, but lately I've been focusing on comparative constitutional law, uh, how different countries' constitutions work, and how different countries' constitutional arguments proceed, how people think about constitutionalism, and also democratic theory. Uh, what are the conditions under which uh, a democracy functions and flourishes, uh, and what are the conditions under which it doesn't? Well, that's a, that's a so obviously incredibly topical areas at the moment. Uh, lots of controversy and discussion around whether you know democracy is in decline around the world, given you know, changes in places such as Russia and so on. But let's uh, focus on uh, on social media and uh, and the discuss and the most recent uh, uh, sort of a lawsuit put forward by former President Trump. Um, yes. towards the social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, let me begin by asking you, do you think that these uh, social media platforms should be considered part of the, the new public sphere? So I have to add one thing, and this is embarrassing, but I neglected to mention that one of my primary areas of research and, and, and uh, teaching and writing is about the American Constitution's First Amendment and free speech issues. So this is really quite, uh, quite in my bailiwick, as, as the saying goes. So the question of whether the cyberspace is the new public sphere really invites the question of what do we think that the old public sphere was about? And if you'll forgive me, I'll launch into a little bit of a, a background discussion. So in, in Australian constitutional law, free speech rights are not guaranteed by a specific textual provision, but in a very famous case, Lang versus ABC, uh, the high court found an implied right to political free speech. Um, and in subsequent cases, the details of that were worked out. The American system is much more libertarian and much more protective of a wide range of free speech uh, in a variety of contexts. And one of the big issues is where the speech occurs. The public square is very different from my living room, uh, to put it very crudely. Uh, in my living room, I am perfectly free to kick somebody out if I don't like what they're saying because it's my house. In the public square, the government may not. So, you know, so my living room is, of course, a private space. The big contrast is the public square, and the original meaning was literally the public square. Think of town squares or town greens or the space in front of a Capitol building or a park or a street corner. And those are places where traditionally, historically, people are free to express themselves in any way they see fit. Um, in American constitutional law, the name for this is forums. We, we identify private forums and public forums. And the public forum, like a public square, the government may not restrict what I say, except, except you know, in limited ways for unprotected speech. There's no theory of free speech that says, I'm entitled to say, give me your wallet or I'll shoot you. Uh, threats, blackmail, libel, a wide variety of forms of speech are regulable. But in the public square, what makes the public square special is that the government may not limit expressions of opinion, political views, um, ideas, right? They can't limit content. The press, has always been in between. That's actually one of a number of contexts that are in between schools is another. Uh, the press is neither exactly a public square nor exactly my living room. It's, it's, it's kind of in between. And the general rule used to be uh, that, for example, television networks were bound by a rule called the fairness doctrine that said if they proposed, if they presented one political view, they had to present the opposing political view. In a couple of decisions ending in 2000, that uh, by the Federal Communications Commission, that principle was abandoned. So nowadays we think of the press as part of the public square. Pretty much anything goes. That is, you can say anything you want, the government 
again, not threats or blackmail or nuclear secrets, um, but in terms of provocative ideas or insulting speech or you know things that might be offensive, the press is perfectly free. Each press actor, in turn, each television station, each newspaper is a private actor, like me in my living room. That is the same rule that says the government can't prevent the press from saying something means they're not required to present anything. That was the old fairness doctrine that said if you present one side, you have to present another, that rule was abandoned. So Fox News does not have to, is not required by any principle to present a contrary view to its conservative speakers. And MSNBC, these are two famous American networks, uh, each on the opposite side of the political spectrum. MSNBC, which is considered left and progressive, is not required by law, it cannot be required by law, to present conservative speakers to counter its progressive views. And that's where we stand when we get to cyberspace. And so when you ask, is cyberspace the new public sphere? In some ways, the better question is, is cyberspace part of the old public sphere? Uh, or is it, right, is it, is it a space in which, like the airwaves, a space in which public actors, call them TV stations, choose what to broadcast and what not to broadcast? Or is it a bunch of private property owners, like my house and the house next to me and the house next to that? Uh, or is it the town square? And the short answer is nobody knows. It is legally nobody knows. Clearly it is the case that social media, cyberspace generally have become an important, if not the primary place where people join together and express opinions and, and go to find expressions of opinions and information. That much I think you know, can't be gainsaid. Um, but it's not that long ago that we could have said it about television and radio and the newspapers. And so the question of how to categorize uh, cyberspace is very unsettled. And it is hard to answer, very hard to answer by using the old categories and applying them in any straightforward way. So the short answer to your question is cyberspace, the new public square, my answer is sort of and maybe. So within that context, then, what is President Trump's um, argument that he's been excluded or having his uh, his speech rights limited by by uh, by being excluded by the platforms? I mean, it would sound that he's he's drawing on the concept of the old public sphere uh, to uh, to put to mount his argument in the sort of this new hybrid space that really remains quite undefined. Right. Um, so. <laughs> The difficulty with describing President, excuse me, President Trump's arguments in the filings, in the lawsuits that he's filed against uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter and so on. Um, the difficulty is one, I've read the filings, it's quite difficult to figure out exactly what his theory is. Uh, two, he had a much stronger theory he could have used and for some reason chose not to. So let me walk through those one at a time. Uh, as I mentioned, the days are long gone, 20 years now. Uh, when, for example, television broadcasters in America were required or could be required as a First Amendment principle could be required by the government to give equal time to different views if they didn't want to. And so one short answer is, look, Facebook is a private company. The First Amendment restricts what the government may do. It does not restrict what private companies may do. Uh, we, 20 years ago, we decided the government may not require private companies supposed to be used they don't like. So this is a foolish lawsuit and that's the end of it. And if you were you know, a legal conservative lawyer, that is a lawyer who only wanted to make you know, arguments that fit current law, that's the easy answer. This is an utterly meritless lawsuit with no basis whatsoever because the First Amendment only restricts the government. It doesn't restrict private actors. And in the case of media, uh, in the last generation, we've determined that government can't restrict what media shows and doesn't show. Trump has argued in, Trump through his lawyers, has argued in his pleadings an interesting, I think frankly, wildly unpersuasive case. That says, well, in this case, the private actors, uh, Facebook, uh, um, uh, Twitter, et cetera, are acting in concert with the government. They're doing what the government tells them to do. And he has this, his filings contain a fairly, frankly, far-fetched borderline lunatic theory that says, because Democratic members of Congress said things like, gee, it's bad that Facebook has postings that are inspiring violence or, or that are uh, what the actual issue in the case, 
presenting false medical information. Uh, we might want to reconsider the legal status. In Trump's filings, his claim is that was coercion that required these actors to dismiss certain things. Or alternatively, he argues both sides, uh, it was collusion that the democratic lawmakers and the operators of these private uh, platforms were colluding to cut out certain messages and certain voices. Um, it's an extraordinarily weak, in fact, fanciful argument. Uh, I have yet to see any analyst, uh, any legal analyst, who gives any credence of any kind to the specific arguments that are being claimed. But what makes this so strange is there's actually a strong argument that could be made. So first of all, why is it such an unbelievably terrible argument? It's an unbelievably terrible argument because of the facts, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, it makes no sense to say anytime a congressman says, gosh, I think General Motors has too much influence over the car industry, that coerces General Motors into changing their policy. That would be absurd. Uh, it makes no sense to say that you have collusion between government actors and private actors uh, any time uh, you know, a government official expresses an opinion and a private actor responds some way. And on the facts, it makes no sense because in fact, this is zero evidence that any of these platforms have discriminated against conservative views. Uh, they've excluded specifically defined forms of unacceptable expression like threats and uh, falsehoods, known falsehoods and so on. And I'm sure we'll get to the sort of federal law communications decency act uh, but under federal law, they've done what precisely they're entitled to do. One can absolutely argue that federal law should be changed, but it's just fanciful, even silly to argue that, you know, just simply ignore it. The strange part is there's a really good argument Trump could have made, and it goes like this. Long ago, uh, people got around with horse-drawn carriages. Eventually, the railroads were developed. The thing about railroads is you really can't live without them. If you're a farmer shipping your crops to market, if you're a businessman trying to get goods, if you're just trying to travel, there's really no way to survive economically without the railroads once they exist. And the theory goes back to a very old English common law notion called common carriers. If you run certain kinds of essential businesses, you have to give everyone access. Originally, this was operators, canals and ferry boats and things like that. Uh, and the idea was, you know, this is way back, 16th century. In England, if the people who run the ferries could discriminate against you know, they only serve their friends. Uh, that would mean anyone who wasn't their friend had no access to the economic flow of England. Over centuries, these doctrines have been widely developed. It's worth noting, these are the principles on the basis of which the US Congress and Supreme Court desegregated restaurants and theaters. They said these are common carriers. They're places of public accommodation. And there's a really good argument to be made. And people across the political spectrum have made this argument that, that entities like Facebook, are effectively common carriers. They're so prevalent and so important that either they should be broken up or if they're allowed to continue operating, you know, they should not be allowed to exclude voices except on very, very narrow grounds. But weirdly, Trump's argument is not that. Trump's argument is this very strange, uh, very peculiar First Amendment theory. Uh, and as I say, I have difficulty seeing any legal merit in that theory whatsoever. So I mean, can we speculate why he didn't go down that path or why his team didn't go down that sort sure. of um, Trump path? Has because a... it sounds like a, it sounds like a, yeah, the common, I mean, yeah, the common carrier sounds like a great argument. Well, it's, it's not only a great argument. It's kind of a no brainer. I'm not being clever here. Uh, yeah. I could not count all the articles that have said, you know, we should think about Facebook as a common carrier. I'm, 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 I'm reciting what is um, sort of the obvious, uh, well accepted. If you wanted to regulate Facebook, this is how you would do it kind of argument. But Trump and his campaign have a very long history of filing lawsuits for reasons other than winning them. Uh, uh, some people call this the weaponization of the courts. It's the use of courts to file lawsuits for purposes of fundraising, for example, or inspiring the political base. And if you're trying to inspire the political base, rhetorically, it's much more effective to say, I am saving the First Amendment than it is to say, I'm expanding the common law concept of common carriers to include cyberspace, even though the latter is in fact a much more serious legal argument. So this is a political stunt. Uh, Trump has a very long history of filing, of threatening to file and filing lawsuits that he then never follows up on. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if this case, if these cases uh, are dismissed as I expect on what's called a, a motion for summary judgment, which is where the defendant comes in and says, look, there's nothing here. And the court says, well, the judge says, yeah, there is nothing here. Make it go away. 
I wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, the Trump campaign and Trump himself just let it go at that. And if they do appeal it further, I think it's purely for political imaging and fundraising. It has nothing to do with a serious legal argument, which is kind of tragic in a way because there's a very serious question, uh, a very serious concern about the way private companies like Facebook have come to dominate the, what we were calling before the public square. And there is something, you can make a very good argument. I'm sympathetic to this argument. There's something wrong with a public square and access to the public square is dominated by private for-profit actors. The problem is that that's, those serious arguments are not what's being raised in these lawsuits. I mean, we did see when, when, when the former president was removed from Facebook, we did see, you know, actors from across the political spectrum across the world raise concerns. And would that be their concern? Because it is, they are common carriers and there is that they do now dominate so much that it, it, you, you don't want them making decisions on a whim that, and that are unaccountable. Right. So I, I should be clear, if I wasn't before, the, the common carriers language is from English and American and Australian. Uh, common law, the inherited Anglo system that we all developed out of those of us whose countries come from within that tradition. The broader concept goes beyond that. Germany has a very, very well-developed concept in which private actors have a significant effect on the polity, on the public sphere, are thereby bound by certain duties. In fact, the American legal system is notorious for the lack of duties it imposes on corporations and other forms of private business actors. Uh, even though they may control, for example, the pension market. Uh, we, are, we are among the most, the least regulated right, okay. um, business. No, but these connected. It is the business regulation, the free speech regulation. It goes to a certain kind of libertarian capitalist attitude uh, that says just because a private, putatively private actor you know, has the ability to dramatically affect public affairs doesn't mean they should be subject to some kind of regulation. In most countries in the world, including most countries whose legal systems descend from the English, that's not the case. So in some ways, this, I mean, one reason, as you say, people around the world are expressing concern is they're expressing concern about this uniquely American situation, which we allow for-profit corporations to drive the public policy of, at the moment at least, and for some years now, right, uh, the single biggest and most powerful economy in the world. Um, so it, it's a very big concern and, and I used the word tragic before. I, I should have thought of the famous line of Marx, uh, things that occur the first time is tragedy occur the second time is farce. Uh, these lawsuits are really a farcical way of pointing to what is in fact a profoundly troubling and even tragic situation in that private profit motivated actors are able to control this new public sphere. And we really don't have in place anything uh, like a set of rules or principles about how to treat the new public sphere in the way that we treated the old public sphere. So um, before you mentioned uh, Section 230 from the 996 Communications Decency Act, um, which essentially uh, it, it shielded uh, platforms from liability of the content posted by their users. And this has kind of created, a, a, I suppose, a progressive versus conservative debate uh, progressive voters complain that 230 enables big tech to shrug responsibility from hate speech and misinformation, uh, whereas, you know, the, the sort of conservative voices say that uh, it's an unnecessary overreach um, and uh, that, that gives the, the, the platforms the ability to sort of uh, censor conservative voices. I mean, it's, a, it's two arguments that are obviously on, uh, on either end of the spectrum. I mean, where do you stand? Are they just simply um, uh, politically... Uh, uh, expedient arguments, or do both sides have uh, have a have have a relevancy in what they're arguing? Well, both sides have definite definitely have a relevancy and a significant point to make, but those aren't really the two sides. And the problem is that most of the public participants don't understand what the sides are. So the better way to understand it uh, goes a bit like this. And don't forget, as recently as a few months ago, and even currently. Trump and his supporters were calling for repeal of Section 230. Progressives and Trumpian conservatives hate 230. The reason they hate it uh, is, is different on its content, but the same in its principle. So what Section, Section 230 is called the safe harbor provision. The idea was, and, and I have to say there's a long history uh, in policymaking and lawmaking that when something new comes around, you know, at first we're all terribly excited about how, 
what wonderful things it can do. It takes a long time for us to consider, gee, someone could actually misuse this thing. So the idea was the internet was going to be an unmitigated blessing. It would be a source of free information and opinion. It would, to use our earlier vocabulary, vastly expand the public square. It would be just a new universe of civil enlightened discourse that would raise, yeah, that's not quite how it worked out. Um, the best description I've heard of the internet is, this is why we can't have nice things. It's a bit of a cesspool. One reason, now, and, and so now I'm gonna you know, try and recraft the two sides of the argument. One argument goes, in order for the internet to do all of its wonderful things, to be free and open and, and, and you know, outside the scope of traditional local prejudices, it must be entirely free and therefore, um, well, not only you can't censor it, you can't let what are called internet service providers, the companies that provide the platforms like Facebook, you can't subject them to the kind of liability that for example, newspapers and television stations are subjected to. If a newspaper or a television station, let's say a television station has a guest like me. And let's say I say something libelous. I say thus and such government official is, is, you know, is, is a pederast. Not only can I be sued, the television station can be sued. That's the traditional way media were treated. They were responsible for the content they presented. Section 230 said ISPs, internet service providers, will not be responsible for that content. So that was kind of the anything goes part. They also said, it also says that ISPs are perfectly free to engage in good faith efforts. And that phrase good faith is where a lot of the fighting happens uh, to prevent obscene, libelous, violent, or otherwise unacceptable expression. So initially 230 set up this sort of maximal freedom for companies like Facebook, you're not liable for anything that's said, no matter how vile, how despicable, how evil. On the other hand, as long as you can show you're acting in good faith, whatever exactly that means, um, you can't be in trouble for shutting things out. In 2018, a new law was adopted about human trafficking. And I'm gonna have to uh, pop up the, the, the um, it's the FOSTA-SESTA law, the allow states and victims to fight on land Online Sex Trafficking and Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act. Sorry, it's just hard to memorize something quite that long. In the specific case of, of sex trafficking, platforms that knowingly permit material that is deemed by a prosecutor or a court to encourage sex trafficking are liable. So it's a carve up. Now, there are a thousand issues here, uh, most of which have very little to do with the current uh, discussion that we're having. But go back to 230 for a minute. So 230 is this Harbor provision. Progressives hate it because it means that the most despicable, vile, uh, racist, uh, you know, pick it, name it, pick something really, really, really awful, um, can be posted in the comment section or just as a post and the people operating the blog or operating Facebook or have no liability. Conservatives hate it. Uh, because that carve out about good faith efforts to prevent violence or other forms of bad speech reinforced by this sex trafficking law from 2018 with a very long name, provide a, a reason for those carriers to exclude certain messages. We should be very clear about something. There is absolutely no evidence that it has ever happened uh, that any of these platforms have excluded messages because they're politically conservative. There's, just, there's zero on the facts evidence of that. What happened was, and, and this turns to the specifics of American politics, um, the meaning of conservative in the Trump era became denying the existence of COVID, for example, or denying climate change, or you know, promoting certain conspiracy theories, theories which irrelevant uh, of their political valency fit the descriptions under 230 of things carriers can prevent. So at this point, you have both progressives wanting to get rid of 230, because why should the internet be such a cesspool? And it is. You know, it's very difficult to overestimate, overstate how despicable and how damaging uh, uh, the internet has become. The tactics such as doxing, for example, flooding people with negative messages, you know, there, there are no mechanisms or very few mechanisms 
in Anglo-American law, the kind of law that is in Australia and the United States and other uh, countries of our, system, of our similar system, there are very few mechanisms for dealing with it under speech law because it's not a category of prohibited speech. It's a use of expression that didn't exist before this technology, which is now capable of destroying lives. And so on the one hand, the progressives are, are, are horribly offended by that. And I should point out, by the way, that nowadays progressives are using these same tactics against right-wing mm. speakers. So it's, it's, mm. it's become bipartisan. On the flip side, of course, we have the Trump lawsuit. The assertion, whether founded or not, the suspicion, let's say, that these actors are engaging in political censorship. You know, I think that the, the incidents that have given rise to these lawsuits and these complaints and these concerns um, are really terrible. Uh, truly awful. It's kind of shocking to me that people thought they couldn't foresee them. Gee, no one ever thought. There's an old line, uh, any new technology of communication will be used for pornography. Um, it, 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 you know, I'm sure the telegraph was at some time used for that purpose. You know, any new technology can be used for bad purposes as well as good purposes. And the notion that there was no need to have any thought out system of regulation or limits or standards for this new vastly influential technology in retrospect, or even at the time, I said this in the 90s, was insane. We're now confronted with the consequences of the fact that we never worked this out, and, and now we really have to. Uh, and so I view the Trump lawsuit, on the one hand, legally as kind of a, a joke, to be honest, because the theory of the specific claims uh, are just nonsensical, but a symptom of a very serious issue, um, which is that all, and this is happening in Europe, you know, all the places in the world in which the internet has become the prevalent mode of engaging in commerce and communication and social interaction and self-presentation have to come to grips with how this transformative technology uh, requires rethinking our categories of legal liability and, and acceptable limitations on speech. And so I find myself in the very odd position of saying Trump has a point and, 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 and Alan Dershowitz had a point, for example. He said, this is the first amendment issue of the 21st century. He didn't say it very clearly, uh, but he's quite right that figuring out how to deal with cyberspace is the challenge for free speech principles and public, and the idea of the public square in the 21st century. And what I think these lawsuits really point out is that we have not even begun to wrestle with those questions. So one, one final question then, I mean, um, just extending that point, does, I mean, obviously both, you know, both ends of the political spectrum believe that something needs to be done here. Right. I is, think so, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is, I mean, is, will partisanship get in the way of finding a solution? Uh, or do you think there's a, a, a sort of a, do you think that this is such a vexing issue for the sort of the contemporary democratic state that, um, for the Republic, that it need that they're willing to cross those, those political lines and, and work together to find an issue? Well, there's actually a third alternative. Uh, the third alternative, instead of crossing political lines, is the, is the inadvertent alliance phenomenon. Uh, when people on both sides have a similar interest, sometimes working entirely separately and in different states and uh, uh, influencing, you know, you think of political influence as a national phenomenon, but of course, political influence occurs locally. An individual member of Congress, individual senator, uh, a party representative. So you could have, you could imagine very easily uh, progressives in Northeastern and, and, and Western and Western states, uh, an arch cultural conservatives in the South together teaming up inadvertently uh, to get rid of this, this wild, you know, uncontrolled space of speech. The problem is, and this is the, the challenge of um, perhaps the, the misunderstanding, if I may, of populism generally, what ties left populism and right populism? After all, historically, as well as today, populism is not only a right-wing movement, although at the moment, you know, in Europe in particular, that seems to be dominant, but it's also always been a left-wing movement. The answer is opposition to the establishment, the powers that be. In America in particular, the powers that be are the business community. And the business community loves Section 230 because the thing about despicable speech and racist speech and vile speech and controversies is it's profitable. All of this is immensely, terribly, profitable. Any attempt to treat cyberspace with the kind of limitations and restrictions that for hundreds of years were considered necessary and essential elements of having a functioning public square will run into the fact that the money involved has become, has come to be on a scale uh, 
unparalleled in human history. When you try to regulate Jeff Bezos or you, you know, uh, uh, try to regulate Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, you're dealing with the new rubber barons and the old rubber barons had nothing on these guys in terms of their wealth and their power and their influence. So the really interesting dimension here to me uh, is how much we have a very direct conflict between preserving or restoring the norms of civil society and the capitalist impulse, I know I sound like some sort of Marxist here, but the, the money-making, the profit-making mm -hmm. impulse, the business impulse uh, of maintaining what is an absolutely mind-boggling cash-producing cash producing enterprise. And that cash-producing enterprise, as we've seen over and over and over and over, uh, makes more money the more it is outrageous. And so that, to me, is the real, the real political problem in, in trying to tame this beast. How this is a, this will open up another can of worms, which I'd love to go down, but unfortunately we're out of time, so we'll leave it at that. Um, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. It's well, uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Fascinating. Thank you so much, and I'm sure we'll follow it up at a future at a future discussion. Thank you. I'd, I'd be delighted.